That just makes me think about some talks that I've been given over the last uh, few weeks. Are we bending trees? Or are we building ladders? Are we going to continue to build ladders? Or are we going to, at some point in time, start to think about bending trees? So I love that um, comment, uh, Dr. Simons. Thank you so much. Uh, so next, we have a few questions for the panel. My first question is for Carlos. Uh, the healthcare industry is a model for providing evidence-based treatment to all patients. As a workplace, do you see parallels with um, other industries, so between healthcare and other industries? Are there lessons learned when we think about biased mental models and stigma that can be transferred to different types of workplaces, such as education or manufacturing, technology, et cetera? And if so, what could be some of those challenges or barriers? So in thinking about the panel that you moderated, if we think about the healthcare industry as compared to other workplaces, uh, what are those lessons learned? And then what are some of the challenges and barriers if we're really going to get to obesity solutions? Yeah, I think that's a good question. <clears throat> so the healthcare industry, it's probably just like any other work sites where they have employers and, and they have the employee and they pay and they pay for the benefits. Interestingly, because we have some, a speaker from UK where uh, the, uh, the burden of providing access to healthcare is not on, on the business, not on the industry. It's, 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 a, it's a societal uh, issue in terms of how do we provide access to healthcare. And so what's interesting with in the U.S. is healthcare is just another employer. And what's interesting, too, is when you go into business, when you go to business school and you open and you want to open your, your shop, you are not trained on how to provide health care for your employees. That's actually the last thing in your mind. And yet you are the primary uh, industry responsible for providing uh, health insurance to your employees. So this decoupling of uh, of health from employment it's it's important and one of the advantages that the healthcare industry has is they're used to working with uh, evidence base they're used to uh, using data to make decisions and then the decisions they make they they can monitor the uh, the impact on the people they're working on and i think other industries should start thinking about that how do we how, how do they start looking at uh, the availability of information to actually implement policy and to look at the outcomes? And what we know is that the outcomes have shown a huge inequities in how uh, some groups uh, have better health than others, and they can actually trace back decisions they have made institutionally to, uh, to show that these disparities existed. And that you can apply to the education sector, you can apply to manufacturing, you can apply because there's an incentive in this industry. Ultimately, and unfortunately, uh, they're the one paying for, for, for our healthcare. And there is a, a way where we're all in this together that the more, the more we do to promote our employees' health, the more we do to promote the health of our constituents, uh, the better off we're going to be later. And if these this programmatic activities are available in a, a, on a quality basis to everybody in your industry, to everybody in your, in your sector, we'll have actually the opportunity to reduce the stigma, to reduce uh, uh, wa wages, uh, uh, discrimination, to reduce a lot of things that actually are the ones who are uh, holding us back. So much, Dr. Crespo. Uh, now I'm going to move to Carol. Uh, Carol, you mentioned uh, issues, particularly with COVID, as it relates to food security and nutrition security. And given your work uh, in the area of childhood obesity, what are some key takeaways uh, as we talk about structures uh, and biased mental models? That's a great question. Um, you know, thinking back to uh, one of the speakers today talked about the cause of the cause and the cause of the cause is where we need to go um, to determine how we can remove some of those barriers that we've heard about today. But in the meantime, we need to be thinking about 
how do we help people right now get those apples from the, the tree that's bent in the wrong direction um, so that they can protect their health. And we don't need the ambulance. They, we do catch them in the safety net uh, while we're working on um, some of those structural barriers that are just, I think many people are not aware of. I, we all work in public health on this panel. So we're very aware, but I think many people just are not. So I think there's a lot of public education that would be really worthwhile. And now seems to be a really important time to do that when we're looking at some of the things that are going on with voter restriction that Stephanie talked about, the laws that are trying to be put in place, um, taking advantage of some of these changes that have been put in as emergency measures to make food more available to people. Um, it seems like they're working and they're helping a lot of people. Why not make them permanent? If we can do it now in an emergency situation, doesn't it make sense to um, just put them in the everyday business of uh, the way in which we help people to achieve their full potential? Thank you so much, Dr. Bird, Brad Benner. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Simon. I know as a fellow Chicagoan, uh, I know your center is working with a lot of stakeholders around structural issues. And what recommendations would you give policymakers with respect to what new policies are needed? Uh, how do we revise existing policies? If we think about um, this key focus on eliminating some of these barriers, what needs to be modified, what needs to be expanded, and what needs to be eliminated? Dr. Simon? Thank you very much, um, my fellow Chicagoan. <laughs> um, I really think that it's important for policymakers to understand, just as we say health in all policies, is that the phenotype, the phenotype of obesity is actually reflected by many of our policies that are connected to health. And that includes education, it includes housing and food and environmental policies. Those all impact downstream of the phenotype of obesity. Um, and so we've got to really work hard to take a step back and go, okay, so if we have health insurance linked to uh, employment, for example, and we have this COVID-19 pandemic that wiped out certain uh, entire sectors of the workforce for a substantial part of time, in addition to wiping out jobs uh, substantially more for people of color and women of color, then what are we doing with the insurance status right now? Right. And we know that insurance status relates to health, right? And the ability to achieve health and obesity. So we really need to be thoughtful about the upstream policies that impact downstream obesity. Um, and, and so I would really encourage them to take a step back and really think through that. And then uh, with respect to planning environments, trying to encourage, there are many um, uh, programs, including in workplaces that to, that can encourage uh, physical activity every, you know, every hour, every few hours, make sure people are um, engaging in things that help just move bodies around. Um, and then I obviously nutrition and uh, looking hard and deep at who gets to access healthy foods and who doesn't um, and how are there um, structural policies and environmental policies that can improve what all of us have access to, you know, the ripe apples, not the rotten ones. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Uh, the last question I have is for Stephanie. So, Dr. Severa, when we are thinking about or talking about race and racism and how we got here, how can we address it? I know your work is around uh, health equity and social determinants of health. And I know you talked about voting rights uh, and uh, how do we look at voting at the very local level and other policies at the local level to ensure that we can reduce the burden of obesity as well as encourage and make sure all of our citizens have good health? 
So I think, you know, voting rights right now is a, is a very big topic that needs to be addressed. Um, as of March 24th, there were 361 bills um, with restrictive provisions in them in more than 47 states. Five have already been signed into law. And I also want to note that that's 108 more um, bills that were being uh, passed, working their way through the legislature than just one month before that. So there are a lot of people who are working to restrict voting rights, including places that are restricting the ability to hand out food and water to people as they wait for on very long lines in order to vote. So I think that we need to be very aware, first of all, of what's happening. Um, I encourage everybody to learn more about what potential bills are passing through the state legislatures, but also recognizing that we have to think beyond every four years in terms of voting and politics and policies, right? These are happening at the state level by the people who are voted into your state legislatures. And so we need to be aware of who those people are and what they stand for. Most people, if you ask them who your representative to the federal government are, they might be able to name a senator. Um, but when you ask them who your representative is at the state legislature, eyes start to glaze over. And so we need people to really become deeply engaged in the work at that level. And then I think there's a lot of work to be done with empowering communities and working at that hyper local level, encouraging people to attend um, mayor and council meetings. A lot of them are on Zoom now. So whereas people could not attend before because mm -hmm. they were at work and they couldn't, you know, didn't have anywhere to leave your children, go there, find out who's on the zoning board, find out who's making the decision about What's being taught in your school in the curriculum on the school board, right? So we need to get really deeply involved, but we also need to listen to the voices of the communities, right? I think we have a tendency, we have our PhDs and we go, we know what we have to do and we're going to go out there and fix everyone else's problems without really deeply understanding what the community feels that the issues are that need to be addressed. And so you know, we might be thinking about obesity as an outcome and not recognizing food access as an issue or access to fresh water, for example, which we talked about, right, to be able to cook your food. And so really thinking about this from a broader sort of a holistic position while also looking at hyper local politics and how that impacts the lived experience of individuals each day. I think we need to work on balancing both of those. And I, I think we need to encourage people who have been historically disenfranchised to take back the power, right? And, and move past the, my vote doesn't count or my vote doesn't matter. Because as I think we have seen, especially in the last um, national election, every single vote matters and we need people to be engaged. And when people are engaged, change happens. Thank you so much, Dr. Severa. Well, I'm going to open uh, up with a few questions, but please send questions, keep those questions rolling in for our panelists. And I just have a few opening questions to the entire panel. Um, the model is really, uh, the systems model is the foundation that was developed by the Obesity Roundtable uh, for the workshops uh, in the workshop series. Uh, now that you've heard different examples, uh, we talked about housing, we talked about education. What are the solutions that you think can help tackle multiple elements? So what are those leverage points that probably would be best to target uh, those areas that might be amenable to short term uh, and long term change? And this can be any panelist uh, can feel free to answer. So I, would, I, I would say representation is important, uh, representation in government, and, and there is a disconnect. If, if you want your voice heard, you sometimes we have to step up uh, uh, and either ourselves or, or organize to make sure that our perspective, our needs are represented whenever decision makings are being made. I was going to jump in to say two things. Um, one, I love the notion of a thriving wage that Dr. Thorpe mentioned, right? We keep the, think, talking about a living wage, but just getting by is not sufficient. And that inequitably dis, um, disadvantages people who are already living at the economic fringes who are more likely to be people of color. Um, I think that 
it's not an easy solution and it's a highly controversial one, but I think a very honest um, conversation about reparations needs to be had in order to provide resources to people who've had resources stolen from them historically. And then I think we also make, need to make sure when we're talking about issues of race and racism in particular, that we need to include um, communities beyond the racial binary um, and to remember that we need to include indigenous populations as well as Latinx and Asian American populations who often get aggregated and we don't really see the diversity within those communities and the diversity and lived experience. And I think there's an education issue too. So healthcare professionals, and I'll call out my own MDs mm -hmm. for sure, physicians are, are trained out the, out the gate ought to be focused on disease. Disease, disease, disease. We get maybe this much nutrition information and some medical schools may do it better than others. Uh, we don't even know how to take care of ourselves very well as it is in terms of nutrition and physical activities. So um, I think if we could front load the curriculum and weave it through about thriving and wellness and vitality and those types of um, things. Like, what does it really, what does that mean? And nutrition, I think we could do a better job of, of helping, working with patients and with pop populations around um, better nutrition, physical activity, just kind of ingraining it into our life just naturally, instead of just thinking, okay, first, the first disease system I have to worry about is cardiovascular disease. Okay. Hypertension, you know, but really change and broaden our health professions, education, and definitely in medicine positions. Great. And, and to build on that, expanding the diversity of um, people that are in our medical professions, we really need to focus on that. Um, and build that. Um, but also I wanna build on uh, one of the comments that Stephanie made about going to the people. The people who are trying to get those apples, what's, what is it that they see as the solution for it? And we really have to listen to that. I mean, that is the basis of community-based participatory research that we always talk about in public health. Um, and we really need to do that. And you know, the thing that I, I really found interesting about the um, changes to SNAP benefits is previous research has shown when we ask people what, the, would, they, what the, would they need to make those SNAP benefits help them more, they said about $100 a month would really, if you could give us a little extra, about $100, we could make it to the end of the month with nutritious foods that are that's going to meet our needs. Well, guess what? This natural experiment is giving families about $95 extra a month. Um, so I am really anxious to see what those data look like. Um, and is it going to be something that we can support and get the support for to continue on? Because that's a first step toward um, this, maybe not thriving, but moving forward and closer to that goal. Thank you. That sort of builds on um, well, one of my last questions before we really open it up to the audience. Uh, what do you think, when you think about what's been tried and failed uh, or what's been tried and, and uh, at least has some, some promise, uh, what do you think is important for solutions to be scalable and sustainable? So in thinking about the past, really informing our future, how does that point us to our, how does that really point us to an understanding about what can be scalable and what can be sustainable when you think about obesity prevention? That's a very good question. It's, it's challenging because we haven't made a lot of progress and things are getting worse and worse. Maybe some speck of data showing a, a reduction in the prevalence of obesity among one specific age group, and then the next year survey shows, well, no, that's, that disappeared. And if you look internationally, the prevalence of obesity continues to increase basically in every country in the world. And, and this, is, this is a challenge for WHO. And now, you know, we're switching all our energies to look at COVID-19, but actually there's some relationship between obesity and, and, and COVID-19. But the issue of it's it's a challenging question. I wish I could say, oh, you know, there's one, two, three things that have worked 
in these places, but we haven't. And and you know, I, I yield to other members of, of the of the committee here uh, because I I I feel not pessimistic, but it's it's a challenge. It's it's a work that it's a completely incomplete. I would jump in to say that I agree. There's we don't have a lot of great examples of things that have worked. But I think that there are examples of creating healthier communities, um, whether those communities have um, more at, more opportunities for social interaction. So safe park spaces, sidewalks, walkable sidewalks, um, trees, right? Just having trees in an environment. So all the things that encourage people to go outside, to feel safe outside, to be able to move around. Um, and then giving them access to, again, these these wages and thriving wages that allow people to move beyond surviving and into thriving, right? So when all of your energy is being taken up by simply paying the bill so that you don't get evicted, right? Is your focus really going to be on spending time in the grocery store, finding the healthiest foods that you can get, even if you can afford them? And so we have to understand that, especially for low-income communities, there are trade-offs that are being made every single day in order to simply survive. And so I don't know that we can make good progress on issues around obesity or chronic conditions, which are very distal to the lived experience of today, unless you address all the stressors that people have on their everyday environment in order to simply get to the next day. Right? And there's psychological information that tells us when we're living in extreme and acute stress, we are not thinking about what's going to happen in 10 years. That's true. Uh, to follow along with that, thinking about quality of life and how we define that. I think sometimes we forget to ask the people who might be on the receiving end. And, you know, um, for the host house project that I lead at Rutgers, one of the things that we did is spend quite a bit of time talking to families, parents, um, young children about how do they define quality of life? What is it they want? So it, it wasn't nutrition education. It wasn't learning about health. It was about how to build stronger families So um, and how to manage their stress. So our job then became, well, we, need, we want them to learn about healthy eating and how they can um, get more exercise during the day. But we had to approach it from where they saw their real need. And that was stress management. And as I said before, um, building closer bonded families. That's what they were looking for. So that's a real challenge. Sometimes we don't get to deliver exactly the message that we're looking for. And we might have to um, design it a little bit different way. But if that's what it takes, um, that's where we need to go. We need to meet them where they're ready to be. So Actually, I'm going to take my 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 comment on on being pessimistic, because <laughs> I I think the state of the science, like uh, like you my my colleague have mentioned, the state of the science have moved forward. I think we have identified the risk factor. We have identified the things that work, uh, the things that we need to do. I I think the major challenge here is the translational research. Now that we have enough information of what evidentially works, let's start implementing it. And that's probably the hardest part. It's that last part where we need to start looking at zoning, looking at how we uh, space is divided, land use, uh, schools, quality of physical education. I, I think we know what we need to do. And it's that part, which is the most challenging one. And I'm just going to jump in to say that I think it requires much of what we're doing here today, which is taking people who have slightly different perspectives on these issues and bringing them together and, and breaking out of the silos that we tend to work in um, to recognize, you know, the importance of what working across communities and across industries in order to have some progress. Thank you so much for your excellent comments from our panel and planning committee to provide insights uh, on the workshop content. Uh, and as we move forward, uh, the comments and the thoughts become even more relevant as we move through this series to the second and third workshop. Uh, now we're going to open it up. Please um, type your questions in the chat. Uh, and include the speaker uh, whom you would like to direct the question to. 
And we have limited time, so we may not be able to get to all questions, but we're definitely going to try to get it, uh, get to as many as possible. So the first question from our audience, uh, I'm impressed by all of the great information on social determinants of health and the urgent need to address um, the influence that they have on disparate outcomes. Does this mean that investing in Medicaid expansion is like throwing more money at the ambulance on the bottom or, uh, of the cliff versus the top, or is this uh, a false dichotomy? And any of our speakers can answer. So I'll jump in because nobody else has taken it on yet. <laughs> um, you know, I think it depends on what we're thinking about what we're funding through Medicaid expansion, right? We know that we can fund prevention as part of health care um, and whether that funding goes to um, screening services, which we know are really important um, to reduce the long term health care costs and, and moving at least away from tertiary care um, and down to more um, screenings um, and access. And we know also that having a regular health care provider helps create healthier outcomes. And so um, allowing Medicaid expansion to some individuals so that they can get that continuity of care, I don't think is only focusing, you know, at the bottom of the hill. But I think what we need to think about is, again, the complexity of the issue, right? This isn't a one solution that's going to fix everything. It's going to be a lot of people working in a lot of different areas at a lot of different levels to really address and, and ultimately find some solutions. I was going to mention that one of the challenges with, with the question is that one of our fundamental problems, um, referring to the U.S., is that our healthcare system is highly, highly fragmented. It's if, if you fund Medicaid, it's specifically for certain disease-oriented conditions. And our, one of the fundamental problems here goes beyond what happened at the healthcare system. And actually, we're seeing with COVID-19, the healthcare system is designed to treat sick people. Uh, when we're talking about massive uh, vaccination, when we're talking about uh, masks, and so these are other, other systems that needs to be in place that we have not historically uh, uh, funded well. And now we, we, we see that, that we expose our, our, our weaknesses in the healthcare system and, and putting all the money in, 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 in Medicaid when we still need to work with nutrition, which is a different budget. We still need to do with quality of physical education in the classroom, which is a different department. And uh, we, if, if we can defragmentize our healthcare system so we, the different uh, agencies are talking to each other, I, I might be money well spent if, if that's the case. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is directed at Carol. Uh, how would you recommend improving nutrition education in schools? Should we start at the elementary school level to instill good eating habits or where would you start? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's, that's a big question that I think we've been grappling with in, in my entire career, um, long time. Uh, I think we have to think about it in not just in schools, um, and that would be great to have it in schools. Uh, but again, that's a policy issue we need to look at because it's not required in school curricula. You know, the state sets the uh, guidelines for what needs to be covered in schools, and it's just not there. So one of the areas that I've been playing around with in my spare time is can we somehow use it in science curriculum? So beyond school, and yes, I think we should start as soon as kids are in school, you know, Head Start is a really great program in that it does include um, all kinds of activities related to nutrition, nutrition education, and eating, doing it, you know, uh, eating as a family group or as a, a school group together and learning those kinds of activities. We need to have it in WIC. We need to have it in SNAP. We need to have it everywhere we go. We're seeing it in the grocery stores, on the little shelf talkers that we see from time to time. Um, is, and we see it on the food labels. Are people using it? Some. Uh, could they be using it more? Absolutely. So I would love to see it from the moment a woman finds out she is pregnant in her OBGYN's office all the way through. 
out life. Uh, things change. We need to learn and, and stay up to date. So yes, it needs to be in schools, needs to be everywhere. Thank you, Carol. Um, our next question, um, there is mountain evidence that taxation works to reduce consumption of unhealthy products such as sugar sweetened beverages. Yet taxation is often perceived negatively by communities that might reap the health benefits the most and is also confronted by very powerful industries and political allies. This issue sits at the intersection of obesity, structural racism, poverty, and community self-determination among others. How might we uh, how might we as a field approach um, and resolve the conflicts on this issue uh, in uh, uh, in ways that we strive for equity? So when we think about this intersection, and this is a, an issue that the planning committee has discussed, uh, where we have taxation and SSBs, you see communities that may uh, have a negative perception of taxation. And so what do you think is the best way uh, to look at this approach and how might we resolve some of the conflicts? For any politician, uh, taxation is not sexy. It's, you, it's not uh, something that you volunteer for. There are some champions out there who are open and their constituent will support them if that's the case. But that's that's one of the challenges. This is this is policy at the highest level. It, that this is the this is the kind of thing that goes through the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which you know uh, how very few things go through there. So you need to have some knowledge of what that means. There are also uh, uh, it, it's it also seen as, as punitive because you're you're taking money away. Uh, so uh, so so you might want to look at the other side of incentive of how you raise the price of things that you don't want people to buy, but you also lower the price of things you want people to buy. So you can look at it at both ways. How do you make these healthy foods uh, to compete uh, at, the, at the price level with the unhealthy foods? You said people might, you might sway. The taxation is very powerful. We've seen it in smoking. We've seen it in cigarette smoking, how you can actually predict the people who quit smoking by how much money you, you increase taxes. I, I, I so but but it requires uh, uh, a fearless uh, legislator to do it or or your level to do advocacy. Another challenge with taxation is this this are powerful industry, big food, big tobacco, big alcohol. Air, I mean this they have they have politicians in their pockets. But here's <laughs> here's what you see is that when a community, a local community wants to do that, then policies are uh, coming to place to preempt that at the state level. And then when the state finally decides we're going to do this, then there are policies that comes at the national level to preempt that. And so it requires a, an, a, a huge amount of uh, national uh, effort uh, to be able to get any of these taxation measures to pass through any uh, uh, legislative house. Yeah, to build on that, it is punitive. And I think we all view the foods we choose to eat are a personal decision and we should have that um, personal decision. So, uh, you know, it's a very complicated issue. And if it comes from within, from the population, the city um, or state that wants it, that's one thing. But it's very top down. And uh, is it really addressing what the main, main problem is? Um, and I'm not certain that it is. Uh, I think there's a lot more that we need to understand about whether or not taxation um, is the way to go. I, I was going to jump in to also say that I think we need to be really careful of unintended consequences. Um, so when you have... Um, limited access to full service grocery stores where you might have a wider range of opportunity to buy something other than the sugar sweetened beverages, which tend to be less expensive. Um, you might be putting an undue burden on communities, low income communities and primarily communities of color, where they may end up spending a larger share of their limited income on foods, on sugar sweetened beverages, because that's simply what is available to them. And so, as Carlos mentioned, if we are not using tax revenue to subsidize healthier options, 
and to make those healthier options more available, then all we're doing is hurting the communities that we think we're trying to help. And so, again, this is one of those situations where you have to look not just at the intervention, but what are the outcomes of the intervention and what are the potential unintended outcomes and how can you address them going into the situation so that we're not reacting. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here, whether it's policies, whether it's individual behavior, whether it's um, these interventions that we're doing is thinking about prevention rather than reacting and treating after the fact. Thank you. Uh, we have one comment. Uh, without public policy supporting commerce and other equity measures, I feel our theorizing is a repeated message with no changes. How do we really get at some of those uh, policies that are very much upstream that look at commerce, redistribution of, of, of wealth uh, and other equity measures that are sort of at the top versus more downstream? And then how do we use those to get changes? And I'm going to direct this at Stephanie. So, yeah, I was about to jump in anyway. Um, you know, this is where I think, you know, I'm going to go back to knowing who your representatives are. Right? I think we all need to also understand they represent you. So you can call them. Right. I have all of my representatives. I live in New Jersey. They hear from me regularly and they take your phone call. And honestly, I know hashtags are great and, and getting the movement out through social media is, is important. I think that raises awareness. But where the rubber meets, meets the road is actually showing up to do the work. And so if you have something you care about, organize the people who are like minded and call your representatives. Right. What gets through to your representative is what floods their phone line to the point that the people who work for them get frustrated because they can't do the rest of their work because all they're doing is answering questions about the impact of sugar sweetened beverage taxes, right? That's where the work comes. Organize, make your voice heard, those grassroots organizations, and actually work and reach out. Believe it or not, your governor will work with you on, on crafting legislation if you have a plan in place. So you have to think about what solutions, what you want to see happen, and then advocate for that strongly. And again, go back to empowering the community that you're working with or that you come from to know that your voice matters when you vote, but also in between elections. And so, you know, try to get involved. And if you have the opportunity, if you have the time, get to know your representatives Maybe you can get appointed to the zoning board. Maybe you can get appointed to the transportation board. Maybe you can run for school board. And that's where the change is going to happen. So we can talk a lot. And I think we feel good when we talk about it because we feel like we're making change. But unless you're actually willing to put some skin in the game and work towards it, we're not going to get any further ahead. question um, that uh, we have is about intersectionality. And so what role does intersectionality play when we think about solutions? We talk a lot about race, but we know that uh, race, gender, income, um, issues of sexual minority status, all of these things align to create disadvantage. So it's not just one uh, attribute people can face layers of disadvantage. So how do we look at intersectionality uh, and what role does that play when we think about solutions? I would say that if we focus on the intersections, on the people who are most disadvantaged and address their needs, then we will all do better, right? So we need to think about those intersections in ways that are meaningful. And again, I think we need to make sure that we make space in whatever environments we are working in, whatever communities we're working in, to make sure that we are amplifying those voices as well so that their needs can be heard. And I think one group that hasn't been mentioned in here but is also highly invisible and has a lot of disparities are individuals with disabilities, whether they're physical or developmental disabilities, because we think about, again, you know, COVID right now, and how do you get a COVID vaccine if you're not physically capable of getting to a mega site, or if those mega sites are so noisy, um, and you're somebody who uh, is living with autism, and those sites are too noisy, and they're, they're, you cannot physically manage to go into them. And so when we think about the most vulnerable, we all do better because that's how we make progress and change. If we're only focusing on the averages, there are, we're not going to change the disparities, 
Right. And that's so much. That, oh, yeah. Uh, your no. last closing comment, Carlos. You can have oh. the closing comment. Oh no, no. I was just going to add uh, just just one few comment, which is this intersectionality is, is like a whole bunch of Venn diagrams. But in the middle of all this Venn diagram, it's it's the human, and I and I think we need to to realize that there's a dignity of the person, and that we need to do whatever we can do for what's best for the individual, regardless of where they're coming from. So all this intersectionality should think about keeping the dignity of the human being in the middle. So much. And thank you to our planning committee. Uh, this was a great panel. And so we appreciate you participating in both the planning and then tapping you to do the closing comments and reflections on the workshop. So thank you so much for your time and consideration and efforts. Um, we had terrific speakers today. We would like to thank all of our speakers, as well as the participants that joined uh, online. The recording for today's event will be posted online in the upcoming weeks, and a proceedings uh, in brief will be released later this summer. Uh, this is a series of workshops that uh, are focused on the systems model. And so our next workshop in this series uh, will center on data and innovative approaches. I'm very excited um, to kind of move to this next step uh, past our first workshop that really dealt with that content around structural racism, bias, mental models. Uh, we're going to move into understanding more about what data and innovative approaches we need for sustainable systems-wide changes to reduce the prevalence of obesity. Uh, the workshop will feature invited presentations and discussions that uh, will center on existing data or models that explore the connections between structural drivers and systems-wide changes that are needed to really get at the core of this issue. Um, lastly, you'll receive a post-event uh, evaluation survey shortly. Please fill that out. Uh, your feedback is critical uh, to understanding the impact of this workshop as well as areas for expansion. And so we encourage that you fill out the survey. And then we hope you uh, tune in again in June, as well as for our last workshop, which centers on building back better. Uh, and so our next workshop is June 22nd. And again, that will focus on data and innovative approaches. And so thank you so much. I'm going to adjourn the workshop. And again, thank you to the planning committee and our speakers. So have a good weekend. Thank you so much.